Chapter Three of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Three, The Air Raid. One. There wasn't no home life in England until the Kaiser started a dropping bombs in people's backyards," remarked Bindle oracularly. Funny thing, he continued, how everybody seemed to find out how fond they was of settin' at home because they was afraid of goin' out. Mr. Hardy looked at Mr. Gupperduck, and Mr. Gupperduck looked at Mrs. Bindle. They required time in which to assimilate so profound an utterance. Mr. Gupperduck had firmly established himself in the good graces of Mr. Hardy and the leaders of the Alton Road Chapel. He was a constant visitor at the Hearties, especially at meal-times, and at the chapel he prayed with great fervour, beating all records as far as endurance was concerned. "'I don't agree with you,' remarked Mr. Gupperduck at length. "'I do not agree with you. The scriptures say, every man to his family.' Mr. Hardy looked gratefully at his guest. It was pleasant to find Bindle controverted. "'You know, Alf, you never been so much at home.' wheezed mrs hardy hitting her chest remorselessly you never do go out on moonlight nights you trust him said bindle hardy and the moon ain't never out together we're told to take cover said mr hardy with dignity and what about us poor fellers what has to be out in it all demanded bindle looking down at his special constable's uniform you should commend yourself to god said mr gupperduck piously he that putteth his trust in him shall not be afraid. Ain't you afraid when there's a raid on? demanded Bindle. I have no fear of earthly things, replied Mr. Gupperduck, lifting his eyes to the ceiling. He's all Gupperduck and camouflage, ain't he, Millikins? whispered Bindle to his niece. Then aloud he said, Well, Mrs. B ain't like you. She's afraid like all the rest of us. I don't believe much in coves what say they ain't afraid. You ask the boys back from France. You don't hear them a saying they ain't afraid. They knows too much for that. There's one above who watches over us all, Joseph, said Mr. Hearty, emboldened to unaccustomed temerity by the presence of Mr. Gupperduck. Mr. Bindle, said Mr. Gupperduck, our lives and our happiness are in God's hands. Wherefore shall we feel afraid? Well, well, remarked Bindle with resignation. You and Hardy beat me when it comes to pluck. When I'm out with all them guns a-goin' and bombs a-droppin' about, I'd sooner be somewhere else, and I ain't a-goin' to say different. Perhaps it's because I'm an heathen. The hour of repentance should not be deferred, said Mr. Gupperduck. It is not too late even now. It's no good, said Bindle decisively. I should never be able to feel as brave as what you are when there's a raid on. Oh, ye of little faith, murmured Mr. Gupperduck mournfully. Think of Daniel in the lion's den, said Mrs. Bindle, and Jonah in the er, interior of the whale, added Mr. Hardy with great delicacy. Now, remarked Bindle, shaking his head with conviction, I wasn't made for lions or whales. I suppose I'm a bit of a coward. I don't feel brave when there's a raid, Uncle Joe, said Millie Hardy loyally. She had been a silent listener. And Mother isn't either. Are you, Mums? She turned to Mrs. Hardy. It's my breath, responded Mrs. Hardy, patting her ample bosom. It gets me here. That's because you don't go to chapel, Martha, said Bindle. If you was to turn up there three times on Sundays, you'd be as brave as what Mr. Gupperduck is. Ain't that so? he inquired, turning to Mr. Gupperduck. You're always sneering at the chapel, broke in Mrs. Bindle, without giving the lodger time to reply. It doesn't do us any harm, whatever you may think. "'That's just where you're wrong, Mrs. B.' remarked Bindle, settling himself down for a controversy. "'I ain't got nothing to say against the chapel, if they only let you sit quiet, but it's such an up-and-down sort of life. When you ain't kneeling down a askin' to be saved from what you know you deserves, or kept from doing what you're nuts on doing, you're a-standin' up a-singin' hymns about all sorts of uncomfortable things what you says you hopes to find in heaven.' you have a jaundiced view of religion mr bindle said mr gupperduck ponderously a jaundiced view he repeated pleased with the phrase have i really remarked bindle anxiously i hope it ain't catchin no he continued meditatively 
I wasn't meant for chapels. I seem to be able to think best about Evan when I'm settin' smokin' after supper with Mrs. B. a-bangin' at the stove to remind me that I ain't there yet. What does me, he continued, is that I never yet say any of your chapel coves happier for all your singin' and prayin'. Why is it? Look at you three now. If you was goin' to be plucked and trussed tomorrow, you couldn't look more fidgety. Instinctively, each of the three looked at the other two. Mr. Gupperduck shook his head hopelessly. "'You don't understand, Joseph,' murmured Mr. Hardy, with mournful resignation. "'I can understand Ruddy Bill getting drunk,' Bindle continued. "'Because he do look happy when he's got a skinful. But I can't understand you a-wantin' to pray, Hardy. I really can't. I only once see a lot of religious people happy, and that was when they got drunk by mistake. Lord, didn't they teach me an old Uggles things?' he blushes like a gal when i mentions it uggles is a nice mind he has well i must be goin arty in case them uns come over to-night you ought to be a special arty there's some rare fine gals in putney hill do you think there'll be an air raid to-night asked mr gupperduck with something more than casual interest in his voice maybe said bindle casually maybe not funny things air raids they've changed a rare lot of things he remarked meditatively once we used to want the moon to come out sort of made us think of gals and settin on styles mrs b was a rare one for moons and styles wasn't you lizzie don't be disgusting bindle there was anger in mrs bindle's voice now continued bindle imperturbably no cove don't want to go out and set on a style a oldin of a girl's and not im when his job's done he starts arf for ome like giddy-o and you don't see his nose again till the next morning Bindle paused to wink at Mr. Hardy. "'If there's any gal now,' he continued, "'what wants her and eld on moonlight nights, "'she'll have to hold it herself or wait till peace comes.' "'If you would only believe, Mr. Bindle,' said Mr. Gupperduck earnestly, "'making a final effort at Bindle's salvation, "'if thou canst believe all things are possible. "'Ah!' Mr. Gupperduck started into an upright position "'with eyes dilated as a loud report was heard. "'What was that?' he cried that remarked bindle dryly as he rose and picked up his peaked cap is the signal for you and arty to put your trust in god in other words he added it's a gun in what fulham calls the barker bindle looked from mr hearty leaden hued with fright to mr gupperduck whose teeth were chattering on to mrs bindle who was white to the lips well i must be orf he said adjusting his cap upon his head at a rakish angle if i don't come back mrs b you'll be a widow and widows are wonderful things cheero all bindle turned and left the room his niece millie following him out into the passage uncle joe she said clutching hold of his coat sleeve you will be careful won't you then with a little catch in her voice she added you know you are the only uncle joe i've got and bindle went out into the night where the guns thundered and the shrapnel burst in sinister white stabs in the sky whilst over all brooded the great queen of the heavens bathing in her white peace the red war of pygmies two two hours later bindle's ring at the hearty's bell was answered by milly oh uncle joe she cried joyfully i'm so glad you're back safe hasn't it been dreadful her lower lip quivered a little you ain't been frightened millikins have you inquired bindle solicitously a soldier's wife isn't afraid uncle joe she replied bravely Millie's sweetheart, Charlie Dixon, was at the front. "'My, ain't we getting a woman, Millikins?' cried Bindle, putting his arm affectionately around her shoulders and kissing her cheek loudly. "'Everybody all right?' he inquired. "'Yes, I think so, Uncle Joe, but,' she squeezed his arm, "'I'm so glad you're back. I've been thinking of you all the time. Every time there was a big bang, I—I I wondered—' "'Well, well,' interrupted Bindle. "'We ain't going to be downhearted, are we?' it's over now you'll hear the all clear in a few minutes bindle walked into the hearty's parlour where mrs hearty was seated on the sofa half asleep hello martha he cried ah joe she said i'm glad you're back i'm afraid there's been a lot of her breath failed her and she broke off into a wheeze bindle looked about him curiously hello what's happened to them three little cherubs he inquired mrs hearty began to shake and wheeze with laughter and milly stood looking at bindle what's happened millikins he inquired done a bunk have they they're they're in the potato cellar uncle joe 
said Millie, without the ghost of a smile. Somehow it seemed to her almost like a reflection on her own courage that her father and aunt should have thought only of their personal safety. Bindle slapped his leg with keen enjoyment. "'Well, I'm blowed!' he cried. "'If that ain't rich! Three people what was talkin' about puttin' their trust in God a goin' into that little funk hole. Well, I'm blowed!' don't laugh uncle joe began millie i i she broke off unable to express what was in her mind don't you worry millikins he replied as he moved towards the door i better go and tell em that it's all right mr hardy's potato cellar was reached through a trap door flush with the door of the shop with the aid of an electric torch bindle looked about him his eyes fell on a large pair of scales on which were weights up to seven pounds this gave him an idea carefully placing a box beside the trap door he lifted the scales and weights in his arms and with great caution mounted on to the top of the box suddenly he let the scales and weights fall with a tremendous crash full in the centre of the trap door at the same time giving vent to a shout millie came running in from the parlour oh uncle joe what has happened she cried are you hurt it's all right millikins knocked over these ere scales i did ain't i clumsy ush moans and cries could be distinctly heard from below ere help me gather em up millikins i hope i haven't broken the scales having replaced the scales and weights on the counter bindle proceeded to pull up the trap door all clear he shouted cheerily there was no response only a moaning from the extreme corner of the cellar ere come along arty what do you two mean by taking my missus down into a cellar like that is it gone quavered a voice that bindle assumed must be that of mr gupperduck is what gone he inquired the bomb whispered the voice oh come up gupperduck said bindle don't play the giddy goat in the potato cellar what about you putting your trust in god there was a sound of movement below a few moments later mr gupperduck's face appeared within the radius of light he had lost his spectacles and his upper set of false teeth his hair was awry and his face distorted with fear he climbed laboriously up the steps leading to the shop he was followed by mr hearty literally yellow with terror what have you done with my missus demanded bindle she she she's down there stuttered mr gupperduck then you two jolly well go down and fetch her up or i'll kick you down cried bindle angrily nice sort of sports you are leaving a woman alone in an old like that after taking her down there mr hardy and mr gupperduck looked at bindle and then at each other slowly they turned and descended the ladder again for some minutes they could be heard moving about below then mr hardy appeared with mrs bindle's limp form clasped round the waist whilst mr gupperduck pushed from behind for one moment a grin flitted across bindle's features then seeing mrs bindle's pathetic plight his manner changed ere millikins get some water he cried your aunt lizzie's fainted between them they half carried half dragged mrs bindle into the parlour where she was laid upon the sofa vacated by mrs hardy her hands were chafed water dabbed upon her forehead and a piece of brown paper burned under her nose by mrs hardy she had not lost consciousness but stared about her in a vague half-dazed fashion mr hardy and mr gupperduck who had retrieved his false teeth seemed thoroughly ashamed of themselves it was mr hardy who suggested that mrs bindle should spend the night with them as she was not in a fit condition to go home as he spoke the all-clear signal rang out joyfully upon the stillness without two long drawn-out notes that told of another twenty-four hours of safety Mr. Gupperduck straightened himself. Mr. Hardy seemed to revive, and from Mrs. Bindle's eyes fled the expression of fear. "'Well, I must be orf,' said Bindle. "'Look after my missus, Hardy. You come along, Mr. G.' he inquired of Mr. Gupperduck, as followed by Millie he left the room. "'It was sweet of you not to laugh at them, Uncle Joe,' said Millie, as they stood at the door waiting for Mr. Gupperduck. "'Nobody didn't ought to mind saying they're afraid, Millikins,' said Bindle, looking at the serious face before him. "'But I don't like a cove what says he's brave, and then turns out to have about as much art as a shillin' rabbit. Come along, Mr. G. Good night, Millikins, my dear. Are we downhearted? No!' And Bindle went out into the night, followed by a meek and chastened Mr. Gupperduck. End of chapter 3 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California
shaggybark.blogspot.com